ID the Future, a podcast about evolution and intelligent design. Welcome to ID the Future. I'm your host, Andrew McDermott. Today, I conclude my conversation with Dr. John West, discussing British writer C.S. Lewis's prophetic legacy for today regarding science. Dr. West is Vice President and a Senior Fellow at the Discovery Institute, where he serves as Managing Director of the Institute's Centre for Science and Culture. His current research examines the impact of science and scientism on public policy and culture. Dr. West has written or edited 12 books, including most recently the expanded edition of Darwin Day in America, How Our Politics and Culture Have Been Dehumanized in the Name of Science. The Magician's Twin, C.S. Lewis on Science, Scientism and Society, and Walt Disney and Live Action. Dr. West has also directed and written several documentaries, including two on C.S. Lewis. The Magician's Twin, C.S. Lewis and the Case Against Scientism, and The Magician's Twin, C.S. Lewis and Intelligent Design. In Part 1, Dr. West unpacks some of Lewis's views on science, and he explains what scientism is. The idea that modern science, particularly modern physical science, is the only way that we know truth, that it's our only source of truth about the natural world, about ourselves, about life. We talked about an essay Lewis wrote called Willing Slaves of the Welfare State, including Lewis's views about science progressing without ethics and governments becoming technocracies beholden to the scientists, while citizens lose freedom and privacy. Dr. West discussed the COVID pandemic and how that public health crisis revealed much of what Lewis warns against. On this episode, Dr. West explains how scientism harms scientific progress. He also reveals how Lewis refutes the idea of scientific materialism, how scientism leads to moral relativism, and how we can bring science back into alignment with older, deeper human truths. Let's jump right back in. How does scientism and scientocracy harm genuine scientific progress? Yeah, well, I think it's what I've already alluded to, which is if you have the idea that the the country should be or your nation society should be guided and dictated by science and that there's a group of people that are dubbed sort of the spokespeople for science, that breeds uh, – well, well, for one thing, it ties science to the quest for power. And so actually, this is something Lewis did point out in this and other essays, which is if you fuse not only expertise and knowledge, uh, you know, if you fuse that with the power to basically dictate to everyone else, that's an unholy combination. And it's not just about science. It's about, I, I would say I'm a Christian, so I think we're fallen. I think we're sinful. So I think it's not just about the abuse of science. It's about the abuse of any sort of expert knowledge. And I would agree with Lewis, which is so in past ages, you had, say, in the, in the Christian Middle Ages, we actually have some people today, I think wrongly, who are so-called, quote, Christian nationalists, unquote, who just, who are upholding this idea that you want religious power fused with the state. <laughs> I think that's a terrible idea. That theocracy is just as bad as Scientocracy. And Lewis's point was this when you fuse some claim for a superior absolute knowledge with power, that's an unholy combination. And you're actually encouraging corruption. Because if you're someone, let's be honest, Anthony Fauci was not a brilliant scientist. If you know anything about his history as a, as a public science official, I'm not trying to demonize him, but he wasn't a great scientist. Francis Collins, now I'm going to get into trouble. I just actually, he isn't really a brilliant scientist either. Both of those people made a career in government power positions. If you fuse, if you, just like in the old days where, where, you know, governments wanted to speak in the name of God and, and the church wanted to exert earthly power. Well, if you want to be a tyrant, how do you do it? You fuse yourself with, thus saith the Lord. And you had the divine right of kings. You had a various religious church officials try to exercise a civil power. And it was a mess. It was horrific. Similarly, and again, Lewis said this. I mean, and Lewis said, you know, he detested theocracy. That's also why he detested scientocracy. Because if you fuse science, which is the search, at some point, is the search for knowledge about the natural world, which is a very good thing. And Lewis was not anti-science and neither am I. But if you fuse science, 
the scientific knowledge with the right to power, you're really changing the incentive structure and you're really asking to bring in little petty and not so petty tyrants into science, quote unquote, because they really want to rule your life. It's not because they're such good scientists. And in fact, that's what we see. I mean, during COVID again, uh, there are many really well-standing scientists, Jay Petrachero at, at, at Stanford, those some at Harvard and Yale, who had a different view, but they were muzzled by, I'd say, small-minded people like Anthony Fauci and even Francis Collins, now that we have gotten a lot of the Freedom of Information Act requests. You know, they, Francis Collins was talking about people who didn't agree with him on some of the COVID policies as being fringe epidemiologists. Well, Francis Collins wasn't even an epidemiologist, and he certainly wasn't outstanding period. And so he was basically calling people at Stanford and Harvard and Yale because they disagreed with him as fringe. I mean, that tells you something about the dangers of fusing any sort of expert knowledge with political coercive power. So yeah, I think this harms genuine scientific progress because it puts the people speaking for science in a way of that they can easily shut down any sort of debate or disagreement. Science proceeds based on debate and argument. And the reason why we have certain views today that are different from two or 300 years ago is that there was allowed to be vibrant arguments. Anytime science is fused with the power to suppress debate, that actually harms genuine scientific progress. Right. Especially when you have big tech playing the willing part of the muzzle, uh, you know, helping governments and leaders uh, in their opposition to free science, as it were. Well, another idea that Lewis challenges in his work is the idea of scientific materialism, the belief that matter is the sole and fundamental reality. What's wrong with this idea, and how does Lewis refute it? Yeah, so materialism goes back a long ways, to, at least to the ancient Greeks, that were just blind matter in motion. Yeah, and because it was just so outlandish to most people, it was never the majority view. But then we get to sort of the 18th, 19th centuries, and we have people taking some new discoveries in the physical sciences and chemistry, uh, in physics too, um, and, and trying to claim, oh, well, we now have this overwhelming empirical knowledge that shows that we are just blind matter in motion. And then you have Darwin, who sort of takes some of these ideas into biology and saying, yeah, blind matter in motion ultimately can explain even life itself, including human beings. So that's sort of the, the belief there are many things wrong with it. I, I think for sake of time and other things, Lewis's biggest critique of that view is that if you hold that view, it's pretty much hard to have any belief, justified belief about anything. I mean, so science itself is a rational process that, that assumes, you know, the laws of logic, it assumes um, a lot of things, that it assumes that rationality is real and that we can have access to the real world. But if our minds are ultimately the product of this blind and purposeless material process, there's no real reason to have confidence in our own minds. And this was his sort of critique of sort of Darwinian accounts, among others, of how we got the mind. You know, if, if the mind developed through this blind mechanical process, basically only because it helped physical survival, on what basis should we have confidence that our minds are telling us anything true, either about Darwinian theory or anything else. And you know, today, this idea, which Lewis sort of got from a book, at least in part, called a series of lectures by Arthur Balfour, who's best known for the Balfour Declaration, the uh, you know, British prime minister. But he also, Arthur Balfour was sort of a gentleman philosopher, and he gave the Gifford Lectures that became a book called Theism and Humanism, which Lewis listed as one of the top 10 books that influenced him the most. And in that book, Balfour basically makes the idea that, you know, if you're trying to explain mind or morality for that matter, or these other things as just being produced by things that are less than rational, less than mind, or less than moral, it's like you're getting something from nothing. I mean, how, how do you get mind from a mindless process? He just, he thought that was contradictory. And Lewis, in his book Miracles and in other essays, made that same argument. Today, we have people like the great philosopher at Notre Dame, Alvin Plantinga, who's made the same argument even more rigorously. But that argument goes back to Lewis, goes back to 
to Balfour, and in some sense actually goes back to Plato. But Lewis really made that that argument. So I think, you know, it's Lewis argued that materialism really was self-contradictory because our, our belief in materialism is based on logic and reason, supposedly. I mean, we're offering arguments for materialism. But why should we think that our beliefs in materialism, our arguments for materialism are true if our very minds, if they were produced according to the way materialists think, weren't produced necessarily to produce truth. I mean, we've we've shaken our confidence in the mind so much that we have no reason to even believe in materialism. And Lewis noted, by the way, that uh, you know Steve Meyer wrote a great book called Darwin's Doubt, which dealt with a, another of Darwin's doubts. But I would argue that really Darwin's biggest doubt was on this very issue. Darwin wrote in some letters to people that you know one of the things that troubled him. I guess it didn't trouble him enough, but uh, that, that did trouble him was that, that this gnawing doubt that if his mind, if he was the product of the type of unguided pro- material process that he was claiming, why should he even have confidence in what his mind was saying? And it's interesting, Lewis read Darwin's autobiography. You can go to the Wade Center at Wheaton College and you can hold it in your hands. And if you look at the the version of the autobiography that Lewis had, the edition, this area where where Darwin is raising this question about how can he trust his own mind given his belief and you know and how the mind came about Lewis underlined it so so Lewis understood that this was you know the Achilles heel of materialism is it really refutes your mind it refutes the very scientific claims that you know if you say that science proves materialism but you have no grounds to believe in science to begin with you're in a world of hurt and this does play into morality, too. I mean, scientism can work its way into moral relativism because in the end, there's no way to validate moral knowledge. So morality becomes subjective. Yeah. So if, if physical science, modern materialistic science is the only aspect, you know, where you get to truth, well, then that means that things like morality are, I mean, you, could, you have to deconstruct them as not that there's sort of this transcendent moral truth across time or situation, but that all it can be is some sort of accidental product of this materialistic process. And of course, Lewis did write about that. And, and of course, in our own time, probably the biggest claim for this in the name of science is sort of Darwinian accounts of morality, that morality developed basically in service of natural selection to promote physical survival. And that means that in whatever your society, the, the needs for survival are, that's going to dictate morality. And so morality simply is an accidental product of this process at, for what you need in your own society for physical survival and reproduction. And that means that over time and across situation, morality can be radically relative based on your survival needs. I mean, Darwin wrote about this in his book, The Descent of Man, and he tried to put a like lipstick on the pig. He, he tried to make it sound, oh, well, you know, this shows a natural basis in, in biology for morality. But many of his followers, even uh, we mentioned earlier Aldous Huxley, well, his grandfather, Thomas Henry Huxley, when it came to claiming that this amoral materialistic process could explain morality, that was too much for him to, that the nature somehow proved traditional morality, which was sort of Darwin tried to make the claim. Uh, that was too much for Thomas Henry Huxley. He actually said, no, what, what we do, what we see in nature is sort of tooth against claw and, and you're know, trying to, uh, all the things we see in nature, uh, euthanasia in nature, other things that, that is, uh, we're trying to fight against that. So morality is the fight against that. So morality has to come from someplace else. Now, Thomas Henry Huxley didn't have a clue about where it came from because he didn't want to go there to the, the traditional explanations. But in any case, yeah, Lewis did also critique Darwinian accounts uh, and materialist accounts of morality because it's very hard to have some sort of permanent transcendent morality if this is your view of science and, and, you know, if you have a scientistic or a scientific materialist view of nature and human society. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in The Abolition of Man, Lewis writes that modern science requires restraint, and that restraint is unlikely to come from inside science itself. It must be arrested, it must be recalled to a position of submission to a deeper and older set of human truths. What would you say those deeper and older human truths are, and how do we go about restraining science today? Yeah, Lewis actually, he doesn't fully tease this out, but in the the end of The Abolition Man, he actually calls for a new kind of science, a regenerate science. And so I would argue that 
it's true that modern science doesn't have the resources to restrain itself. <laughs> I think that's the problem of its conception. You have to have a conception of science that does have those restraining resources. Science has to be reconceptualized so that morality uh, or views of human dignity, views of the idea that, that humans aren't God, need to be built into the philosophy of science. So the philosophy of science, you know, every discipline has an underlying philosophy. Well, that's true of science. It's true of chemistry. It's true of biology. And so this is one reason why, you know, there are some people who th they themselves aren't, they say they don't buy into scientism, but they want a view of science where they think that, well, you can, we want to have our philosophy and, and metaphysics and things over, over on one side. And then just our, our science, our nuts and bolts science on the other side. Well, I'd say we've lived through that in the last century of trying to do that, and it doesn't work. If your conception of science doesn't in, have in and of itself limiting factors, it will eat everything else up. You can't just have, well, I have my philosophy. And, and so, you know, and, and so, of course, scientific claims in the name of philosophy or, or getting into value questions is, is wrong, but we know that from philosophy, you know, not, not, not from science. Well, if you say that people speaking from, the, from within science, from that kind of science, aren't going to accept it. I mean, you may say that, that science doesn't refute philosophy or morality, but if the scientist's view and the people who speak for scientists, if that's their view of science, that science you know, only shows the reality of things that, that are sort of material, quantifiable, on and on, then they're, they're going to, you know, science is going to continue to, in the name of science, to gobble everything else up. So the solution, I think, actually, uh, I think my colleagues in the intelligent design movement are, are hitting on this, which is that at the basis of science, science itself needs to recognize that it points to this larger transcendent basis, both of right and wrong, but also of design versus no design. And that that is an irreducible component of science itself. And if you understand that the world and the universe is designed, well, then one of the questions you have is, obviously, the designer is, I would say, a whole lot more intelligent <laughs> and a whole lot uh, probably wiser than, than we are. And so some of your ideas to remake nature that, that Lewis writes about in That Hideous Strength and things that turn out terrific, you know, things like eugenics or, or, or other things, you should be properly skeptical of that, not just on the notion that these scientists may not know what they're saying, it may be bogus science, but to, on a broader level, who are we to think that we can reinvent nature? In other words, it clothes nature with a moral grandeur that you need to respect. And, and with some of this, you know, things about creating transhumanism, creating a new human being and stuff, some of the people who are criticizing that, even on the conser secular conservative side, uh, who want to embrace sort of a Darwinian view of nature that's sort of anti-intelligent design, but then also want to claim, well, we don't want, you know, we, we don't believe in human cloning or transhumanism. But I want to say, why? Really, their only objection when it comes down to it is, well, we don't know enough yet, or it might turn out bad. Well, but where do you get the standard of good and bad from? And if you really think nature is the product of this accidental, blind, evolving process with no higher end in view, if we can do better, why not? Now, if you have a design view of nature, that there's this transcendent standard that sort of nature ultimately is responsible for, I think it gives you more humility and less hubris of, about mucking up nature. You know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try to improve. It doesn't mean you should, shouldn't try to ameliorate things, but it does place, uh, like I said, I, I think, you know, the, the best way to explain it is we have no right to play God. But that presumes you believe there's a God or an intelligent designer that you don't want to play. And that, I think, needs to be built into the very conception of science. Science can't be this rogue outlier for the rest of human knowledge or, 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 or you know, human ethics. Right. And it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It, uh, it's part of a more all-encompassing view of reality and of humanity. And we need to make it that way. Well, if Lewis were with us today, final question for you, Ob observing the events of the last few years, and of course, looking ahead at where we might be headed, given all the hints, what advice do you think he would give us? Pray? <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's pretty bleak. Um, I, and I think he, he would have found that there. Although, 
you know, anyone who is uh, a person of faith, let alone, uh, I would argue, if one happens to be a Christian, which I happen to be, that there are great grounds for, for hope that go well beyond you know, where, where we're living right now. I would say that if you want Lewis's advice, I would encourage everyone to read That Hideous Strength, which I think is one of the, the great novels against Scientocracy in, in the English language, because it's all there. You know, whether it be the manipulation of the media, whether it be the manipulation of sexuality, whether it be these uh, transhumanist ideals that we're, we're going to you know, evolve ourselves into better creatures, uh, the, the denial of, of morality in the name of science, and the, the corruption of science when it's fused with government power, and the corruption of academia that, that, in, that goes ultimately into nonsense, that ultimately undercuts any sense of objective truth or meaning – which, for those of you who have read that hideous strength, without giving it away, by by the end that's pretty clear. <laughs> and all, all I'll just say is uh, the Tower of Babel. Just just think what happened after that, and and you'll you'll know what I'm talking about if you've read that. So I, I think people should read that. And I think the the main thing is actually you're know, getting a little more serious here. If if you understand the problem, that is the first step toward a solution. And so. The reason why the things happened that Lewis lived through in the 1930s and 40s and 50s and early 60s, the reason why some of those horrific things happened was because people had a very naive view of science. At the beginning, in, in many ways, at the beginning of the 21st century, we're like at the beginning of the 20th century. You had a lot of naive views, sort of pre World War I, that science could be our savior. And even despite the horrors of World War II, going into post-World War II, you had people think, you know, is the age of the Jetsons, you know, uh, of that cartoon. Or in, here in Seattle, we had the 21st century World's Fair, you know, that gave us the Space Needle, which is a, is a, is a fun monument. But the, this idea that through science, it couldn't just help us for better physical things, which of course science can do many benefits, but somehow it was going to leave us to this utopia I think that by rec if you recognize that that's not true and you recognize the dangers of claims made in the name of science, then you actually do have some, you know, you might be able to avoid some of the worst excesses. I, I think like the, the COVID pandemic, I hope that you, you mentioned sort of the emergency powers. One of the things coming out of the COVID pandemic that people should be concerned about, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, regardless of where you are on, you know, whether you're for masking, not for masking, uh, for vaccine mandates or not for vaccine mandates. One thing that I think you should come out is that many of the lockdowns and policies that were, were done on, on people were done largely at the behest of unelected government officials, or in some cases, the executive branch that was elected, but there was simply rubber stamping. Legislative assemblies had no, nothing to say. And this idea, and in some cases, the emergency powers lasted for years. I think there were some places that even this year, early this year, finally let go of their emergency declarations. Well, in some states, they have actually tightened that up. And I think that that is something that as a society we need to look at. We should not, we really need to tighten up who can issue and the limits on emergency powers. And, and I would say require after the first 30 or 60 or 90 days them to actually be approved by a legislative assembly where you can force an actual debate uh, with your elected representatives. So I do think there are some things that once you're forewarned, you're forearmed, and that you can be raising questions. But people first need to know the questions to ask. And I think Lewis is a good place to start. Some great advice there. Well, Dr. West, thanks for taking the time to commemorate Lewis's legacy with us today. I hope you'll be back soon to continue the discussion. I hope so too. Thanks. For a book-length treatment on these topics, be sure to get a copy of the Dr. West edited volume, The Magician's Twin, C.S. Lewis on Science, Scientism, and Society. And if you want to watch it in video form, like I said, he has some great documentaries up on YouTube and elsewhere as well. Well, that's all the time we have. For ID the Future, I'm Andrew McDermott. Thanks for listening. Visit us at idthefuture.com and intelligentdesign.org. This program is Copyright Discovery Institute and recorded by its Center for Science and Culture.